Like for me, eating, I know it may not sound healthy, but eating carnivore, eating mostly meat has been, has made me feel really good, both mentally and physically. Is there something you could say about the kinds of diets that may improve longevity, but also enable calorie restriction? Well, sure. Uh, I mean, the first thing that's important to know is that while many people are interested slash obsessed with what they eat, the data that's come out of animal studies, at least, is it's far more important when you eat than what you eat. And this was a, a fantastic study a few years ago by my friend Rafael da Cabo at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda. And he had 10,000 mice on different diets, hoping to find the perfect mix of carbs, protein, and fat. And it turns out that the only ones that lived longer were the ones that only ate once a day. And so that, if we're, we're not mice, but I think that we're close enough to mice that this tells us a lot. But okay, but I still think the best bang for the longevity buck is to do both well, eat less often and eat the right things. Now I'll preface this to say, I'm not a nut about this. I will eat occasional, very occasionally a dessert. Usually I steal from others, which doesn't count, right? Exactly. Uh, but you gotta live life, right? What's what's a long life if it's not enjoyable anyway? Yes. But what I've, I also have found, and this is, I'll, I'll get to your question in a second, but my microbiome right now is, and stomach is at a point where if I try to overeat on a steak, which I did a couple of days ago, I actually had a, a, a chicken, uh, a fried chicken specifically, uh, for two days I felt terrible. I couldn't sleep, it wouldn't go down. So I'm now at a point where even if I want to binge on meat and fried foods, I, I just can't, it just feels bad. Um, but what, what do I recommend? Well, what the data says, which I try to follow is uh, that plant-based foods will will be better than meat-based foods. And I know that there are a lot of people who disagree, but one of the facts is, well, there's a few facts. One is that people who live a long time tend to eat those type of diets, Mediterranean, Okinawa diet. They're eating mostly plants with a little bit of meat and not a lot of red meat. Uh, and the other fact is that in animals, we know that there's a, there's a mechanism that's called mTOR, little m, capital T-O-R, that responds to certain amino acids that are found in more abundance in meat. And when it responds, it actually shortens lifespan. And the converse, if you starve it of those three amino acids, uh, in mostly in meat, then it extends lifespan. And there, there's a drug called rapamycin, which some people are experimenting with, that does that. So you might be able to, you know, I'm just saying this here from all my colleagues, we don't know the results here, but you could potentially take a rapamycin-like drug and counteract the effects of meat mm -hmm. on, in the long run. Don't know, we should try that actually, we could do that in the lab. <laughs> But uh, getting to the bottom of this, what I think is going on is that just like testosterone and growth hormone, you will get temporary, maybe not temporary, um, immediate health benefits. You'll feel great, you'll get more muscle, energy. But the problem is, I think it's at the expense of long-term health and longevity. Well, this is actually something I worry about in terms of long-term effects or the, the cost in terms of longevity. It's very difficult to know how your choices affect your longevity because the Im impact is down the line. Like just because something makes me feel good now, like eating only meat makes me feel good now, I wonder what are the costs down the line? Well, think about what I, I was saying about the trade-offs between growth and reproduction, which is what a mouse does, and a whale that grows slowly, reproduces slowly, lives a long time. It's called the disposable soma theory. Um, Kirk would just uh, propose that in the 70s. What meat probably does is put you in the, the mouse category, super fertile, grow fast, heal fast. And then if you want to be a whale, you re should restrict meat uh, and do things that promote the preservation of your body. Is it uh, difficult to eat a plant-based diet that uh, you perform well under, so uh, mentally and physically? Just almost, I'm asking, uh, almost like a um, anecdotal question, or unless you know the science. Uh, well, the science is still being worked out, yeah. but from the synthesis of everything that I've read, uh, I try to eat a diet that's definitely full of leafy greens, uh, particularly spinach is great because it's got the iron that we need, plenty of vitamins. I also um, try to avoid too much uh, fruit and uh, berries, particularly fruit juice, definitely avoid that sugar high. Spiking your sugar is not healthy in the long run. 
The other thing that's interesting is we discovered what are called what we called xenohormetic molecules. Let me unpack that because it's a terrible name, and I take full responsibility <laughs> with my friend uh, Conrad Howitz. The xeno means cross species, and hormesis is the term that what doesn't kill you makes you live longer mm-hmm. and 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 be healthier. And so we're getting cross species health improvements by molecules that plants make. And plants make these molecules when they're also under adversity or perceived adversity. For instance, uh, I, I understand if you want really healthy or uh, good oranges, you can drive nails into the, the bark of the tree before you harvest. Same with wine, you typically want them to be dry before you harvest mm-hmm. or covered in fungus. And that's because these plants make these colorful and xenohermetic molecules that make themselves stress resistant, turn on their sirtuin defenses, the sir genes, remember? And when we eat them, we get those same benefits. That's the idea. And we've evolved to do so. This isn't a coincidence. It's my theory, our theory, that we want to know when our food supply is is under adversity because we need to get ready for a famine. And so we hunker down and preserve our body. And by eating these colored foods, so practically speaking, if it's full of color or if there's been some chewing by a caterpillar, caterpillar, organic, grown locally in local farms, I'll eat that versus a watery, insipid, uh, light-colored um, lettuce that's been, been grown in California. So you want vegetables that have suffered. You want the David Goggins as a vegetables. That's <laughs> the xenohermetic a... molecules. I love that term. <laughs> I'm going to take that one with me. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I follow him on Instagram. He's it's, it's always screaming. So you want the... It, that he's basically uh, the, the, the xenohermetic version of a human. Um, I, I like it. So the, these are the molecules that are representative of the stress that has been um, that uh, a plant has been under. Yeah, the best example of that is resveratrol, which many people, including myself, take as a supplement. Grapes or grape vines produce that in abundance when they're dried out or they have too much light or fungus, uh, and that we've shown activates the SIR2 enzyme in our bodies, which remember is what extends lifespan in yeast and slows down aging in the brain. That's beautiful. Yeah, I, t- I tend to avoid fruit as well. So green veggies, anything that's not very sweet. So I would just say you're relatively low, like you try to uh, avoid sugary things as well. Yeah, I'm fairly militant about that. Um, I rarely would add sugar to anything. Occasionally I would um, eat a, a slice of cheesecake, but that would be you know maybe once or twice a year. You, know, you have to give in occasionally. But yeah, anything that's sweet, I would rather substitute something like stevia if I need a sugar hit. 